thank you everyone. And thank you, organizer, for giving me a chance to talk our research in here. Uh, before I start talk our, our our lab's research, I would like to give you a bit of history of our lab and acknowledge the contribution of Southern Family to our lab. Southern Arthritis Research Lab was firstly established in 19, in 1961 by a big donation from Southern Family which enabled the establishment of this uh, lab. And this Southern Lab is the first arthritis lab ever established in Australia. And the, with the first uh, director, Dr. Robinson, acclaimed the forefather of rheumatology in Australia and being the first director. And also late on, in 1987, another big donation from Southern Family by Isabel Miller enabled the Southern Family to expand significantly to the level until now we have. And now this, actually this contribution are still continued by um, Isabel's daughter. So we would like to thank their big contribution to our lab. So our lab's first research is on the rheumatoid arthritis. It is an autoimmune disease uh, developed from the infection from the genetic factors with the non-genetic factors such as environmental factors like smoking, infection, and other factors, for example, being female, unfortunately, and others like um, obesity. So this interaction actually induces the autoimmunity at the mucosite of, uh, of our body and then induce the uh, inflammation and then autoantibodies. And in normal condition, actually, these antibodies are used to fight the infection, like a bacterial virus. But in these conditions, however, they attack on the damaged joint <coughs> and leading to the rheumatoid arthritis. And as Lin and David already um, talked about, uh, the big burden of the disease here. I just want to emphasize a bit about in the rheumatoid, rheumatoid arthritis in Australia. Around 2% of Australian people have reported to have RA. And then the onset of this disease, mostly actually within the age of 35 and to 65, which means these people are active in the, their working force. And also, I is associated with the increased mortality. And being with I, actually, you are more likely to suffer mental health problems and other chronic conditions. And this graph showed that the prevalence of the other chronic conditions in the people with rheumatoid arthritis and versus people who don't have, for example, cardiovascular disease. And the people with I, almost 50%. However, without the people without this condition, only around 80%. So that's a very big difference. To make it worse, currently, like all other arthritis, there's no cure exists. But fortunately, like over the past 20 years, uh, the treatment for this disease has been like uh, improved dramatically, most uh, due to the discovery of the disease mechanisms. And uh, here I show you some like key cells and the pathways found so far involved in eye disease. And uh, we look, they look a bit complicated. But remember, this is only a tip actually of iceberg of the disease mechanism. There's so many of them we completely don't know. But that's what we try to do. And with, um, although this uh, is a very small discovery, but with these funny, actually now, there's many therapeutic strategies has, have already been developed by this finding. And I think people, if you have arthritis, especially rheumatoid arthritis, you will really realize the, especially the use of biologicals like uh, an anti TNR treatment, NR6 treatment, and then um, kinase inhibitors. 
this actually dramatically improves the patient's like health and make the disease let them like manageable. But we have to remember, biological cannot cure the disease, and they are not effective to everyone. Almost, I think around the 50 percent of patients um, are effective. And the other patients, they're not full response to these drugs, and many experience the period of disease remission and followed by flare-ups and the disease progression. So there's a urgent need to actually complete, discover the disease mechanism, and then find the solution for RA, even to this disease. So what we want to do is we want how this happened and what we can do to this disease. And so like Chris Little said, we wanted to um, investigate the cells, investigate the molecules, and see how during the disease process, how they interact with each other, and whether we can do something to actually wage in this interaction and stop disease or even cure this disease. So I list some of our aims, but the ultimate goal of our research is to cure rheumatoid arthritis. So in our research, what we normally do is we um, obtain the patient's tissue from either um, OA or some kind of healthy control and compare it to the eye patient tissue. And then we identify potential like a target by markers followed by the cell culture model, animal model, to confirm or detect their function. And then finally, if we prove off the, the, the target or biomarker we found is, are effective, and then we hope we can translate them into the clinical application. And finally, hopefully in the future, can benefit our eye patients. And in our research, actually, we did find some very important signaling pathways and the targets. And here, I give you two examples. And one, one of them named EPCR, another power and the part two, they are all a receptor protein. And we found that they're all expressed um, in the eye joint very significantly compared to either OA patient or the normal patient, a, a normal healthy control, so which means they are abnormal in eye uh, patients. So then we move to animal model. So we delete the EPCR, this gene, and then we found actually these mice protected from the arthritis. That's what we expected actually. But for power and part two case, and if we delete these two genes, actually mice developed much worse disease. So that's actually, it's not we expected. So from these results, results we can say maybe in the future, we can only target EPCR signaling pathway, maybe useful for eye treatment, but not for part two power. So this data also highlights the, how to say, the complexity of the disease mechanisms. And then we did a bit of further study and found actually part one and part two, they are required for the body to against infection. And uh, like at the beginning, we said the infection actually is a very like, big risk factor for the eye. So um, currently, in collaborating with A3BC by bank, and we are investigating the, uh, the associations uh, between the PAR activity, the um, microbiome change, and the disease activity, and see whether they um, have any correlation. And uh, uh, Lala will give you a bit of detail in her talk. And we're also aiming to find the biomarker <coughs> to predict the treatment response in the patients. 
As we know that I, uh, Lynn and David, they talked to the eye disease is a hetero disease, heterogeneous disease. They have many different types, many different action mechanisms, and it, actually you don't know which drug. This drug maybe were perfect for me, and maybe not what, um, not work at all for you. So, but currently the pre-selection of the drug in especially biological. Most in most patients, in the most situation, based on try and error. So this not only prolongs the suffer of the patient, but also it's a big financial burden for the both for the patient and for the healthcare system, especially if this drug is used not effectively. So what we do is we use patients' own cell like. PBNC, which is blood cells, and also synovial sites, which we extract from the patient's joints, and then treated these cells in vitro with biological or with drugs, either single or in combination, and then according to their response to predict the clinical response of the same drug at the pa same patient. So we hope. From these, we can actually identify specific uh, predictive marker, and we hope in the future, if this research can translate to the clinical application, and therefore this predictive marker guided therapy can like promote the drug efficacy, and also avoid unnecessary to toxicity to the patients, and also, of course avoid the waste as well. Another our uh, research aim to see whether actually we can find the better treatment. During our research, we did find a very special uh, protein which named APC. Uh, it is a natural anticoagulant. We, uh, our body actually produces it. And find that actually this protein can prevents rheumatoid arthritis, either in cell culture model in, or in the animal model via restore the abnormal like immunity in the eye to its normal status, which the work mechanism is very different for current we used the biological because biological work via simply depleting certain cells or certain site kind but we know that every cell, every cytokine in our body have their own function. If you deplete in long term, ultimately will have very bad adverse like uh, effect. For example, you will frequently get the infection or you will possibly get cancer. So this action mechanism, back APC, a very promising treatment for RA. And even more, recently, they discovered peptides. This peptide can mimic APC's function, but without APC's anticoagulant, because APC is a natural anticoagulant. There's always some concern if you translate it. So this peptide make APC even, APC even more attractive as a therapeutic strategy for RA. So currently, we are testing the effect of this um, peptide using either cell models or mouse models. And in mouse model, recently, our data showed they can effectively treat established arthritis. And then we included an entity and other treat, and here we can see that actually they are more effective than so this is very exciting. We hope we can translate them into clinical application in the near future. <coughs> and this is um, our brief introduction to, to you, what we have done and what we are currently doing. And thank you all for your attention. And finally, what I would also like to thank everyone who helped um, to our research. Thank you.
Hello, I'm Lara and I'm the lucky last speaker here today. Thank you. You don't even know me, but thank you. And I am the current Henry Langley Postdoctoral Fellow here at Royal North Shore Hospital campus. I am very lucky to be part of A3BC, the Arthritis Collaborative Biobank, and also a member of a Sutton Lab, of which Mei Lang is also part of. She just talked for us, and we are located here in this very building, so I'm very close to my work today still. And I am going to talk to you about one of my interests, which is a microbiome in rheumatoid arthritis patients. So we're going to take a bit of a left-hand turn here into talking about bacteria. If you do not know what microbiome is, it does encompass all bacteria, all fungi, and all viruses in an environmental sample. It doesn't necessarily mean the human body. It could be a soil sample. But today, I am focusing on the human body, and I'm also just focusing on bacteria. But please don't forget the fungi and the viruses. So thanks to advances in sequencing technology over the last approximately a decade, we are really developing a great knowledge on the human microbiome. And uh, this is very evident because not only have we published a lot of research papers in um, very high, um, very significant journals, but we have also had a lot of publications. And when I say we, I don't mean personally, I mean all scientists in the world, um, in scientific popular scientific magazines, some of which are listed up on this slide. And there's also TV shows out there that you may have seen. And uh, this is great, because microbes are really fascinating. And uh, they have even started to be termed as another part of who we are. And you can kind of see this is a theme these magazine covers are going for. So you have our other genome. You've got your inner ecosystem. And here it looks to me like some sort of engine inside us and the microbes are running it and they're probably helping us in this scenario. So where did all of these terms come from? Well, there are a lot of bacteria inside you and on you. So there's a revised estimate that there's about 1.2 microbial cells in the human microbiome to every one of your own cells. There are about 10 to 100 fold more microbial genes compared to your own genes. And there's not just one bacterial species, there's not 10 bacterial species in you. There are 1,000 bacterial species in your gastrointestinal system. In your mouth, there's about 500 bacterial species. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> in fact, <laughs> there are more bacteria in your body than there are stars in our Milky Way. It's worth a wait for that line. <laughs> <laughs> so bacteria are really helpful to us. They're great for our health and our overall well-being. And these are some of the ways in which they do help us. There's many more not listed on this slide. And because of this, researchers are really interested in looking at what the microbiome looks like in a healthy individual, but also they're interested to see what happens in a person that has a disease or, say, an autoimmune disorder. What happens to the microbiome then? And there has been research out there um, or a funding associations between, say, the microbiome and obesity. And there has been arthritis and microbiome work published. So this is one uh, bar chart here. And this is looking at the oral microbiome. And uh, this is looking at three groups. You have your healthy group, your rheumatoid arthritis group, and your osteoarthritis group. And you can see there's kind of distinct differences between it. So there is an altered microbiome. But this is where I say the but. Um, we have to be very careful because of cause versus consequence. Do the bacteria, or sorry, does the altered microbiome cause the disease? Or does the disease, is the, are the older bacteria a consequence of the disease already being there? So that's something to keep in mind. And this is very complex. There's no black and white answer. And uh, there's a lot of factors that can alter the microbiome, even in a healthy individual. But generally, the microbiome does bounce back after a period of time. These are some factors which affect the microbiome. And uh, in addition, I want to bring up this image here. And this is bringing together a whole bunch of research papers looking at the healthy microbiome in different countries around the world. And this is color-coded. The key's down here. You might not be able to read it. But depending on the color, that's a different area of the human body. And uh, these 
microbes are enriched in different countries. So this is just to highlight, it's not only just these factors, it's at a global scale there can be differences found. So this adds to that complexity and difficulty when you're trying to account microbes into the equation that's already very difficult when you're looking at diseases. Um, I also wanted to bring this up because while there's been work on the microbiome and arthritis in other countries, there hasn't been really any done in Australia. So that's where I come in. I am very interested in looking at the microbiome of um, rheumatoid arthritis patients, and we are currently recruiting here at Royal North Shore Hospital. And what I'm doing, not personally, but what the patients are doing, are collecting their poo for me and their saliva. And then they're coming to me and giving them to me, which I'm very thankful for. And I am extracting the DNA out of them, and I'm looking at the microbial composition. I'm looking to see if there's changes in abundance and also in those species, the number of species present. In addition, I'm also looking at that receptor that Mei Lang mentioned just before. And that's because this receptor has been um, associated with microbial infection, but also it's been shown to be upregulated in some cases in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. Finally, I'm also interested in looking at environmental factors. You can probably see by now environmental factors are really important. And I'm interested in things like diet, um, stool consistency, and also say disease activity. So where are we? We have troubleshot some protocols here. We have some standard operating procedures, and we are already recruiting. So this is my very subtle shout out. If there's anyone that wants to be part of this research, please come find me later in the auditorium. Or if you just want to talk about the microbiome, we can do that too. I'm not fussed what we talk about. <laughs> and that's also for healthy participants too. If you're here and you're healthy, I'll be searching you out. So. I'm going to end up here on this slide. I really like this magazine cover, The Future of Medicine. I think the Biobank really contributes to the future of medicine. <laughs> and I think it's very important because we get a lot more samples to work with, and we also get da data linked with that. So with that, I'd like to thank you for this, and please come talk to me later.